good Friday morning here on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Uh, we are back in the studio and we are talking about the future of the political parties every Friday during the month of November. And the reason we're doing that is because Parliament is, re- is resuming on November 22nd. So we want to talk about the future of the political parties and where they stand and where they're heading into this next Parliament. Uh, to do that, we are bringing on some past candidates, some past supporters, and today is no exception. Today we have a returning guest to the show, not to the Cross Border Interview Podcast, but to the show in general. Uh, Sabrina Grover was the candidate for Calgary Centre for the Liberal Party of Canada. Uh, thank you, Sabrina, for doing this. This is an honour and a pleasure once again. Thank you for having me. It's exciting to be back. I've watched the uh, the progress of the show over the last couple of months, and you've done some great, um, great work, great conversations, and looking forward to this one. Thank you. Um, first off, uh, yeah, I guess we should get this out of the way. Uh, how are you feeling after the election? Uh, you were the you did not win. You uh, Greg McLean did win Calgary Center. So how are you feeling? Um, you know, I think one of the things I've said uh, a lot um, in in many conversations is you can't be a liberal in Calgary and be too heartbroken by your first loss in the city. Um, Got to have a little bit more fortitude than that, and I think a bit more of an understanding of what Alberta and Calgary politics is and how you um, begin to change it. Uh, I feel great. Um, I'm really proud of the campaign that we ran, uh, proud of the people that we engaged <clears throat> across Calgary Center, but really even more broadly. Um, I had messages of support from folks uh, who weren't in my riding, um, lots of people who said, you know, I wish I could vote for you. And uh, I think a couple of the things that really inspired me or that made me excited about the future of Calgary and, and what this could hold is that there were a lot of young women very excited about politics. And I think every year, every election, we see more of that. I think it's absolutely critical that we continue to foster it. Um, and that we create really positive environments for young women to experience politics, both as candidates and in the war room. Um, And I think that maybe contrasts with some of the uh, stories we've seen come out in the last couple of weeks. Um, And I thought, you know, that was like supremely encouraging for me, and I'd love to help foster more of that across the city. And at the end of the day, you know, um, 46% of people didn't vote Conservative, in this riding, I think that's an important note, and I think it um, holds water to what uh, what happens next, not only with the party, um, but in this city. So you mentioned a few things there that I want to just pick up on a little bit here, but um, you said your first campaign. I know we're just uh, almost a month and a half after the election, but are you going to stay involved in politics and potentially run again, or are you just trying to relax after a, almost a tough 30 days because you sort of hit the ground running and you were... Uh, going every day after that election call in August. Yeah, and then I kept running after uh, <laughs> after the federal election ended, and I did the municipal election, which was a, a great joy. Um, I think once you're in politics, you kind of just you're like election. That's for me. That's for me to work on. Um, no, I'm absolutely going to stay involved uh, in Calgary Center, and I would encourage you know any listeners um, of this podcast to come out and um, support Calgary Centers. Come out and see what we're doing. Uh, we will be doing some interesting things going forward and uh, absolutely will be involved in politics in this city. Um, you'll, you'll see me again for sure. Awesome. So let's, let's turn to the bigger picture now. Let's turn to the Liberal Party of Canada. Um, the government was the Liberal Party uh, prior to the election and post-election. It is still the Liberal Party of Canada. From your perspective, and this is you talking from a Calgarian's perspective, How did the Liberal Party on a national level, we'll talk about provincial level coming in a few minutes, but on a national level, how did you think the Liberal Party performed? Um, You know, I think right after the election, there were a lot of people who said, you know, this house is no different than the last house, um, which is, you know, fundamentally true in, in many ways in terms of the actual seat count. I think there were some important seats that changed hands. Um, and some important representation things that came up throughout uh, throughout the national level, including in Alberta, that is really critical um, to how the Liberal Party goes forward. I think uh, nationally, 
urban centers were really important to watch and how the dynamic shifted towards the liberals in many of those centers is critical. Um, so I think nationally, while you know, seat count remains more or less the same to what it was in, in the 43rd parliament, there were some important changes that, uh, that took place. Um, I think performance is really interesting, you know, and keeping my, you know, my partisan hat on. Um, I think there was definitely an over, you know, maybe an underwhelming sense at the beginning of the campaign um, for the Liberals. And I think that that maybe contributed to uh, a lack of momentum coming out of the gate. And we didn't get that momentum until later down the road. Um, and I think that momentum came and of course it resulted in a victory. Um, but from a national perspective, I think that was hard and it um, limited the success of some races that could have maybe otherwise kind of come out of the gate with a little bit more force um, and, and been riding high on like a national wave. Whereas I think we were playing catch up in, in some of these ridings um, to build our own momentum. Did you notice a difference uh, from the start of the campaign to that that mid moment during the, sort of the mid uh, part of the election where the liberals sort of sprung a little bit forward from the uh, O'Toole conservatives? Did you notice that uh, at the doors when that happened and you went, OK, I, I noticed a bit of a change here. Maybe people are a little bit more receptive to the liberal message now than they were at the beginning, as you said, because that motivation wasn't there? Well, I think the major turning point for, one of the major turning points for the Liberals was really the um, the vaccine, the mandate, and the, uh, you know, the way that Justin Trudeau approached the vaccination, which continues to be his approach today. Um, and I continue to be shocked by Aaron O'Toole's uh, lack of approach. Um, I think that that made a huge difference specifically in Calgary and specifically uh, in terms of door knocking, because the lack of support federally by the conservatives for vaccines and the lack of really outward statements that the vaccine is going to be the way that we solve this mimicked what we saw in Alberta. And you had a massive fourth wave that was com combined with the, the national campaign. Um, and I would like, within no uncertain terms, like that's the fault of Al Alberta's provincial government and people who were um, people who were hearing that same message being echoed federally, uh, who are concerned already with our collapsing healthcare system, were not a fan of it. And so I think that the, the comparison that we were able to draw between Aaron O'Toole and Jason Kenney is one, accurate, and um, to really did change the perspective of a lot of minds of, of Calgarians. And I, I want to pick up on that because I wasn't going to mention that, but you, you went into it. So let's talk about it. The moment uh, Jason, uh, Jason Kenney came out and announced the vaccine requirement information, whatever he calls it, the passports, the vaccine passports that they would be implemented, there was a massive shift that people were uh, pissed at Aaron O'Toole, but it was Jason Kenney. Did that make a difference in your campaign where people started saying, okay, the conservatives federally are just provincial conservatives at the end of the day. And the liberals capitalized on that very quickly because uh, Justin Trudeau, I don't think there was a campaign stop about vaccines where Jason Kenney's name didn't come out of his mouth. I wouldn't say it was like that moment. I would say it, would, it started like well before that, right? Okay. I mean, um, I think that that moment was... I mean, just as a Calgarian, as an Albertan, I found the rollout of that announcement to be extraordinarily confusing. I think the things that really changed were, or the things that we were able to propel on in, in our campaign was really the um, initial removal of the, just the COVID protocols. Um, so I don't know if you remember, it's been a long history, so you may not, but um, <laughs> uh, just the protocols around testing, I think were very confusing and, and where we were equating like restrictions and lockdown to actually just like what I would say is like basic COVID testing. Um, I think that that comparison was very confusing for people. And like, we were able to draw that in towards what would a federal COVID response look like if the conservatives were to win. And I think the general collapsing of 
Alberta's healthcare system, the overwhelming amount of cases and deaths on a day-to-day -day basis, and the lack of leadership or attention um, to really vaccines, um, and just coming out strong um, was, was what we capitalized on. Um, you know, I personally think that there's no gray area on vaccines, and I think that the um, way that the Conservatives continue to dabble in the gray area on vaccines uh, was to their detriment in the campaign and continues to be to, the, to their detriment today. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm glad that Justin Trudeau came out so forcefully in support of it. One of the big takeaways from this election was the breakthrough in Alberta. Uh, there are now two MPs back in Ottawa representing the Liberal Party of Canada from the province of Alberta. One here in Calgary, Calgary Skyview with uh, George Chahal, and up in uh, Edmonton Centre with the Honourable Randy Bossano, the Minister of Tourism and Associate Minister of Finance. I just want to make sure that the whole title there. Um, what does that say about the Liberal Party that after two and a half years of being in the wilderness in Alberta, where people thought the Liberal Party was dead, it wasn't coming back in Alberta, that not one, but two MPs would be back in Ottawa now. Um, well, you know, I mean, first, I just want to say, like, congratulations to Randy and George. I think they're both excellent representatives for their constituents. And I think um, that in large part played a significant role in why they were elected. Um, I think the breakthrough is important, and I think it's important that we continue as a party to work on what that means for this province. Um, across Alberta and like a lot of competitive ridings, including Calgary Confederation, uh, my riding, Calgary Forest Lawn, um, I can't really talk to Edmonton because I didn't pay too much attention to that to those ones. At Mill Woods actually is a good example. Yeah. Um, the non-conservative vote was high. And I think that's not something to be taken like for granted. Like, yes, it didn't necessarily convert into winning seats in this election. I think that there's massive room for those to convert to winning seats in a future um, election. Uh, I think if you, one of the things that we have the benefit of uh, for election, for this election is having the municipal elections happen very close after. And so being able to kind of evaluate Calgarians and Edmontonians um, specifically behavior around progressive politics is really interesting in this context because normally you wouldn't get to do that so quickly. And I think what it has shown is that within the urban centers in this province, there is a huge appetite for progressive politics. It's reflected in those who, who we elected in mayor's uh, seats and in council seats in both Calgary and Edmonton. I think what is different in Alberta compared to other provinces is that appetite for partisan progressive politics. And um, it's not something that I think you change overnight. Uh, I think it's something that takes a lot of work. And I think it takes kind of that dedicated uh, grassroots building to realign people's views with a party. And the reason why that doesn't need to happen municipally is because there are no parties. And so people can really vote for the policies and the ideas that they're interested in. Um, and I think that uh, taking that into consideration and, and looking to whenever the next election might be is really important for the Liberal Party in terms of rebuilding beyond just Skyview and, and Center. Um, and I think it's important for us to be able to hold on to Skyview and Center as well. You know, I'm really, really glad that we had those victories. I think those are important. Um, I don't think that they were as strong of a victory as they could be. Um, and I look forward to helping, you know, helping build that going forward. You, you've talked a few times about the urban vote. The Liberals lost seats in rural Canada this election, in Ontario, in Nova Scotia, even Newfoundland, in BC. Um, the Liberal Party is, it, it has sort of become, it's sort of an uh, urban versus rural divide now with the Conservatives taking most of the rural votes and the Liberals taking most of the urban votes. What does the Liberal, what do the Liberals need to do to reach out to uh, rural Canadians and rural Albertans to say, we, we are your party. We are the party that you want to vote for because we represent you, but it doesn't seem that way when you have a electorate who seems to not think that right now? You know, that's a really 
tough question. And I don't know that it's just a question for partisan politics, but just a question about where Canada is going in general. Um, I think the urban rural divide was reflected in the election, but was exacerbated by COVID-19. Um, and I think that the things that we are not rectifying in the way we're doing politics is the economic fears um, in rural parts of this country that maybe aren't being addressed by the way that we're presenting political ideas. And I think in Canada, it's not quite so bad as, as you know what you saw in the United States and the Rust Belt and how that has unfolded. Um, I think that what we need to do is talk about, you know, one of the things I said in, in the campaign is, um, you know, Calgary needs more Canada and Canada needs more Calgary. I think that's true of rural Canada as well. I think <clears throat> rural Canada needs more of that um, messaging and the policies that say that this is an integrated approach to our country and that um, economics are not just urban economics, but they are integrated across our rural um, constituencies. And, you know, in Alberta, I think one of the big things that we don't talk about really enough uh, as a province um, or as a country is the innovation that's happening in rural Canada and rural Alberta. And, uh, you know, we are home to one of the most, um, sorry, one of the brightest, uh, you know, academic institutions in um, farming and agriculture in old, old college. And we're not talking, we're talking about that as though it's like separate from the rest of our economics in Canada and in Calgary. And it's not. Um, we should have graduates who are going to old and coming back to Calgary and who are then facilitating work in rural parts of this province. I think that's really, really important. Um, you know, I can't speak to examples in Nova Scotia or in, yeah. in Ontario, but I think that those are very similar. Um, and I think that that's the attitude that we need to change. And I think it's, you know, frankly, I think urban Canadians probably need a, an attitude, um, you know, awareness on that as well as how are we talking about these parts of our country that are actually contributing significantly to our economy, um, but that we're not really recognizing in that way. Okay. We are uh, two and a half weeks. So uh, November 22nd is when Parliament is uh, set to resume. Uh, we are recording this in the first week of uh, the second week of November, but Parliament is returning first week of November. Oh my God, I can't even, the second week of November. Parliament is resuming on the 22nd of uh, the November. Um, that's going to start with a speech from the throne. That's going to start with um, tables of motions. And then we're going to be heading into the budget in the new year, hopefully. From a candidate's perspective, from an, uh, what would you like to see uh, in the speech from the throne? Let's start off with that right away. What are some of the priorities that you would like to see tackle? And hopefully, George Shahal, the member for Calgary Skyview, is addressing those when getting approached by someone who's writing that speech from the throne. You know, I think one of the uh, most important things that I'd like to see is the continued focus on um, child care and a gender responsive uh, recovery across this country. I think that we focused significantly on it in the lead up to the campaign and during the campaign. And I you know, felt a little bit like it maybe has been lost in messaging over the last couple of weeks. Um, it is critical that we address child care and that we address women's participation in the economy. Um, what happened uh, you know, in terms of how women were affected in their um, in unpaid work and in losing their participation in the economy was significant. And if we don't address it now, I think, especially with childcare policies that are actually implemented, um, I think you'll continue to see that be devastating to, to gender equality in this country. And, you know, I, for one, am not interested in seeing that happen. Um, and I think the biggest thing I would say is it's not a women's issue or a social issue. It's an economic issue for, for Canada continuing to um, recover from COVID-19. You, you just said, thing. sorry, I just want to pick up on that for a second because you've just opened up like a big can of worms that I want to add, talk about for a second. Child care, daycare is a provincial issue as well. They need the provinces to sign on. There's currently two that are withholding, one being yeah. Alberta, one being Ontario. Um, how, how does Justin Trudeau have to approach uh, Jason Kenney now? Because 
Justin Trudeau has a big challenge of trying to sign that deal with Alberta. How does he do it? I think that the mandate that the the fact that the, this government won, um, the fact that the Liberals are in power, and the fact that this there's money on the table, um, you know, this province has already rejected money or not spent it uh, when it's come. I don't think Albertans will stand for that. And I think he, uh, if I was Justin Trudeau, I speak directly to Albertans at this point. Um, and I make the case uh, to to Albertans, and I, I, you know, I leverage that public opinion to continue to put pressure on the province. Um, and I think Albertans were already there prior to the pandemic or prior to the election. Um, and I think if we research with that message, it, it comes back. Um, there's there is no economic recovery, I think, without childcare. And I think women are continuing to feel that burden. And I'd say we just speak directly to those to those voters. <laughs> Looking to get your message out? Looking to get your product heard about? Have an upcoming event in the province of Alberta. For as low as $50 per week, you can now advertise on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Reach out today by visiting www.crossborderinterviews.ca and click on Advertise Now. If you book your advertisement during the month of December, you will get 50% off. Now, let's get back to the episode. Let's go back to some of the priorities that you want hopefully addressed in the speech from the throne in the fall sitting of parliament. What are some of them? What other besides childcare, what are the other ones? So I think, um, you know, as a Calgarian and as an Albertan, I'd love to continue to see an emphasis on um, energy, climate change, and the environment. Um, I heard at the doors all the time about how critical climate policy was to um, to Canadians and to Calgarians, and it really, really is important. Uh, you know, in this election, I saw a substantial shift in my conversations with Calgarians. Um, I've been in politics for over 10 years in this province, and I've never had so many conversations with Calgarians about climate, about the future of the energy industry in a um, kind of renewable clean tech, with a clean tech renewable lens. Um, that moves beyond just talking about uh, pipelines and oil and gas. I think that's a misnomer that the province continues to push uh, that narrative. That's not what Calgarians are talking about on the ground. Um, at least they weren't in Calgary Centre. And uh, I think if we don't address it, you know, we're going to continue to see um, extreme weather and climate events fundamentally affect the health and livelihoods of people in this country. Um, it's not just, you know, that uh, the burning of, of forest fires is hurting trees, it hurts our economy, it hurts people's health. We know that there's fundamental um, issues with that. So I think that that's really critical. And I think it also presents a massive economic opportunity for Calgary and Alberta to be leading uh, forward on a low carbon economy. And I think we signal that strongly during the election. I think we've signaled that as well with some critical investments. Um, I think the province is backed up with, with a few investments of their own. Um, and I'd love to see that, that continue to be a priority. And then last, I think uh, reconciliation um, is uh, obviously going to be a priority. It is a reckoning that Canadians have had um, with, uh, with our own history. Um, it needs to be something that's integrated into all facets of how we um, move forward, whether that's economy, housing, food security is a big one as well, um, obviously linked to climate change and the environment. And I think that that's um, an important part of moving forward. Okay. Um, I would be chastised on social media if I did not ask the follow-up question to your last comment there. Reconciliation is a massive thing that we need to undertake. Um, what were your initial thoughts on September 30th when Prime Minister Trudeau went on vacation? Because I have to ask, because... It, it, it a lot of First Nations and Métis communities were upset. I, I want to know from you, what was your initial thoughts when that happened? Um, you know, I think uh, I was disappointed. Um, and I think that the day could have been handled um, much with much more uh, dignity and a little bit better uh, for um, from that perspective. I also understand, um, you know, that one of the things that I find hard about continuing to talk about this is that um, 
you know, my priority is what does reconciliation mean and how do we move forward? And so to continue to put the, the spotlight on the prime minister does detract from what is truly important here. And um, what are the actual policy points that we move forward on? Um, I think it's important that we have a National Day of Reconciliation. Um, I do think, you know, it could have been handled um, better, but I'd really like to, you know, continue to focus on the future and, and the needs of, of the First Nations, uh, Indigenous and Métis communities in providing um, the, the follow-up to these, uh, you know, pledges we've made and to some of the um, performative things we've done. I think National Recon Truth and Reconciliation Day is important, but what, what does that mean in terms of um, funding or financing a, a, you know, a future that uh, respects our treaties? I appreciate that. And I, I know I put you on the spot there, but I just, I, I, I can hear the chatter right now, people <laughs> sending me emails saying, why didn't you ask that question? So I do apologize, but thank you for answering No worries. That. Um, I want to talk about energy right now as well, because that's, that's one of the biggest things that I think Albertas are, Albertans are sort of hoping for, because there's reports that Joe Biden will uh, cancel uh, Line 5, which brings energy from Western Canada to Eastern Canada. Uh, there is uh, the Prime Minister's announcement at the COP25, 21 uh, summit in uh, Glasgow, Scotland. How, uh, and then, uh, then there's the appointment of the Environment Minister, the new Environment Minister, Stephen Gil Gilbo. Um, this this government is looks like it wants to tackle the climate emergency, and I asked you this on the ballot box, and you, you had a great answer to it. But how can you tackle climate change while also addre addressing our energy uh, resource sector as well? Because there's a lot of people right now who are saying you're doing too much to fight climate change. We need to focus on the uh, our energy resource and vice versa. So how can, how does the Liberal Party need to balance that, those two sectors right now? Um, I think a couple of things. So I would say one, I think it's how you balance investment. And uh, the concern that is the biggest concern out of those who work in, you know, what is uh, our traditional oil and gas sector is the loss of economic productivity, the loss of jobs, the loss of, um, you know, income. And so I think from my perspective, the best thing that the Liberals committed to during the election have committed to um, invest in is uh, the kind of the transformation of the industry and ensuring that as we transform over to renewables, um, to clean tech, to low carbon, that people's jobs remain protected. And you saw that with that very specific um, Alberta, um, I think it was called the Futures Fund, um, but like, don't hold me to that if that's not the correct name. It's been a couple of days since the campaign. Um, but, you know, that is the most, that is the best way to address those fears and allay the concerns moving forward is, will somebody continue to have a job? Will somebody, if they don't have an exact job that matches their, just their skills description, have an opportunity to upgrade their skills? and um, what is the economic impact of trans transforming this industry. Um, I think the Liberals have done that very well. I think that, um, you know, this is not part of the fund, but I spoke to many people who uh, throughout the campaign used the opportunity uh, presented to them with CERV to um, do skills upgrading, to transform their own careers and move from uh, oil and gas into something that's more based around low carbon. Um, I've seen and spoken to so many entrepreneurs who have come out of oil and gas and who have started uh, companies in renewables and clean tech, but also in a variety of other sectors, um, including things like food security, um, agri and innovation, um, fintech. So I think the, the message that continues to be that this is not a financial loss to our country, that this is a financial opportunity and how do we position people for success in that, in that economy? Um, I think the other thing I'd say is we look to industry themselves. Um, you've got the um, oil sands pathways, we've got the commitments to net zero. We have some excellent leaders in um, energy and the low carbon economy who currently 
um, sit within our biggest um, oil and gas companies here. Uh, they're on, you know, they're leading the way. And uh, I think that the government um, supports their, their leadership in that. Let's look to the future again. Uh, we're talking about return to Parliament and what you want to see, but let's 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 talk about the future. Um, I think anyone who is anyone will agree with this statement. The last Parliament, the forty third Parliament, was a complete cluster. Um, things weren't happening, and that's why the Prime Minister said he wanted to. Well, he didn't say this, but he said that he wanted the people of Canada to have a voice in the direction of the uh, the future of Canada post uh, COVID nineteen. We are back in the same position. We are Liberals winning a, a minority, Conservative second place, and the, a block NDP Green. Do you think the parties got it? Do you think the parties got what the Canadian public sent the message of, we want you to go back, we want you to act like adults and work together for the future of Canada. Stop playing political games and work to the, towards a common good because Nothing has nothing can be passed without the Liberals working with one party or another. Do you think all the parties, and I'm not just saying the Liberal Party here, but all parties got that message? Um, this is my <laughs> my very partisan hat, but uh, I would say I, I thought they did, but then the Conservatives um, may not be coming back to the House, I hear, with their vaccination status. So we'll kind of see how that uh, that plays out. Um, I would be interested in in having uh, the MPs back to back to work in the House as well. Um, I think that they they have got it. I think that, you know, obviously the the major difference between the last parliament and this one is that um, hopefully we are not in the middle of a at the start and middle of a global health crisis, but rather at the end of a global health crisis. Um, and I think that one of the things that you will see reflected in how this parliament is organized, both in terms of committees committee work and uh, the works of the, the mandate letters and how ministers undertake their portfolios will be very much implementation based. Um, so we saw pretty large commitments and financial buckets come out of the fall economic statement in November 2020. We saw uh, additional commitments made in budget 2021. Um, there's a lot of money that's been allocated but hasn't been spent. Um, and I think, you know, there were important signals in cabinet that reflect that. So you've got a new minister of housing, um, a very specific and dedicated portfolio uh, to not only spend out um, what is in the rapid housing initiative, but likely to also make future investments. Um, you've got six uh, different economic development portfolios, and we can debate whether or not that was a good idea or a bad idea, but nonetheless, it's happened. And so we know that um, regional economic development will be a priority. That's again, very implementation focused. Um, and so I think when you combine those kinds of things and the fact that we are, you know, in Canada, at least looking towards the end of the pandemic, globally, we are nowhere near the end of the pandemic. We have a massive um, lack of vaccine equity that we need to resolve. But from an economic perspective, do I think that we're, hopefully on track to kind of resume some of that implementation. Yes. Do I think the Liberals have what it takes to do that? Yes. And I think that this is a cabinet that will um, succeed at that as well. Just quick question before we start to wrap up here, uh, Sabrina. Let's go back to that, uh, the cabinet announcements. Um, I was shocked at some of them. I was surprised by a few other ones. What was your initial reaction when you saw the cabinet picks come out on Tuesday, October 26th? Let's see if I can remember do math here. <laughs> um, you know, I think I was initially a little bit surprised about the size of cabinet. Um, normally you see cabinet expand as uh, a mandate goes on. So to come out with a larger cabinet at the start is really interesting. Um, I think it somewhat reflects the amount of work that needs to be done um, that wasn't done in 2020 and 2021. Um, so I think that's important. Uh, the thing that I am most encouraged and excited by is that women hold some of the most important portfolios in this country, uh, defense, foreign affairs, finance. Um, that is massive. Um, and I think that is a huge shift in the way we'll see politics being done in Canada. Um, so more than gender parity, I think is what are the portfolios that women hold um, that is more important to, to me. And, um, you know, I, I think that there's, there's some gaps in the West, um, particularly in the Prairie provinces. 
so how, um, you know, um, Jim Carr's move out of cabinet is um, filled by, by Randy, I think is important and, um, and with Dan Vandell as well in, in a position, it will be important to see how the um, prairies are kind of reflected. Uh, you know, I think it's important that Randy was here today and I think the, um, the announcement with, uh, with Amazon, I think he's already obviously made great progress in this province, but um, I think that those were kind of my biggest reflections. Thank you for that. Now let's talk about the million dollar question in the room. Media, media punditry at its best. Media punditry at its best, uh, uh, literally. I think the moment the election was called, the media started speculating, would this be Justin Trudeau's last election? Would he go on to fight another one? Would he uh, go away after this election? Um, he has come out and said, actually at the swearing in, that yep, he is planning on sticking around and fighting the 45th general election against who, whatever the Conservatives put up, if it's Aaron O'Toole or if they go to a leadership race, who knows? What's your thoughts on the leadership of uh, Justin Trudeau? Uh, do you think he needs to stick around or wait till the end of the pandemic? Or is it time to go take a walk in the snow like his father did in 1984? Um, you know, I think it'll really depend on whether or not the Prime Minister feels he's fulfilled um, his mandate when he you know was first elected as prime minister not just uh, not just in this this most recent election but having been elected since 2015 um does he feel feel like the things he's accomplished are the pieces that he wanted to accomplish for for his time as prime minister of this country um i think it'll also depend largely on who are the stars in this cabinet and, and in this government and um obviously i think um without a doubt i'd you know, Christopher Freeland is a star um, in my mind and in my heart um, and in the hearts, I think, of many Canadians. I think she's demonstrated her um, capabilities as a leader fiercely in this country. So, you know, obviously we, we've got her um, as a very important part of this government and an important part of this government's future or the, and this party's future. Um, there's also, you know, as I mentioned, some really, really important people who've been put into leadership positions in cabinet with very big portfolios and big challenges um, ahead of them. Uh, how those people shine um, will be and address those challenges will be important to what the leadership of this party looks like. Um, you know, I, I think that there's always a balance in Canadian politics at the provincial and federal levels on a leader heavy race and a leader heavy led party versus a, um, you know, more of a, an egalitarian approach to there's not just one person that's leading, but there's many. Uh, in the last little while, we've had a lot of um, provincial and federal politics be leader heavy. Uh, I think that there's maybe a time where that's starting to, to fade and we're gonna look at more of an egalitarian kind of like there's many leaders, not just one, obviously. At the end of the day, there's going to have to be a leader to the Liberal Party, whether or not it's Justin Trudeau or someone else. Um, but I think we're starting to rely on the shining stars of many other people is something not just for the Liberals, but also for some other provinces. <laughs> Jason Kenney um, might want to look at that as well. So, uh, Brian Jean's coming out of the woodworks. Who knows? Who knows what's going Oh, gonna yeah. <laughs> we should talk about that next time. There you go. Um, Sabrina, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been a pleasure, and uh, the future looks uh, red right now for the uh, country of Canada, being a Liberal Party government. Uh, we will see what the state from the throne holds on uh, November twenty second, and what the part, what the government looks like in twenty twenty two, and let's see what George DeHaul and Randy Bossano can do for the province of Alberta. Thank you so much for awesome. doing this. Thank you for having me, and uh, I look forward to chatting more in the future. We'll see. We'll see what the new year holds. There you go. Um, for everyone here at the Cross Border Interview Podcast, thank you so much for tuning in. If you haven't already, scroll down to our show notes, hit the subscribe button on YouTube, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But also, if you want, uh, we do have a Patreon account, so head over, donate two dollars. It does help the show continue on. Uh, and we will be back here Monday morning with another great week long series of shows. So. Tune in to then. Until then, have yourself an excellent weekend. Have yourself an excellent night and keep talking, guys.